You're listening to The Hello Well with Danielle Show, a podcast taking women of color on a journey exploring all things wellness and travel related. We're all about showing you how to put on your oxygen mask first and creating lasting self-care habits that will free you to travel the world and live the life you truly desire and not one you have to fake loving. I'm your host, Danielle Washington. Now let's buckle up and start this journey. Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of the Hello Well with Danielle podcast. I am Danielle Washington, your host, and I hope you are not hungry because today's topic is everything about food and travel. Like I truly believe that food is the universal language. It's not English, it is food. Through food, food is a reflection of the people who eat it. And through food, you can learn so much about someone's culture, the traditions, how, they, how they're living. You learn so much. And I, if you think about it, let's just do an exercise real quick. Think about one of your favorite places, like wherever you love to go. Close your eyes and think about your favorite spot and visualize it. Right now, I don't know why I'm visualizing being in Paris and I'm seeing I'm walking up the cobblestone roads. I see these beautiful buildings. I see the river and I see someone holding a baguette. And then I see a cheese store and I see, you know, my favorite little bistro. I can have a couple different things I'd love to eat. I see some red wine. I see people sitting, you know, under this red awning, you know, people watching. And food is a huge part of our travels. If you think about some of your favorite places, food is literally a part of what made that one of your favorite places. And I could not have this conversation with any other person than celebrity chef Nina Gross. She has miraculously found not only to get inside of some of these kitchens and these hidden places to and learning, she's actually learning from these people how to make the meals and getting the recipes. I'm all about like finding great places, but I have not thought about actually asking to get in the kitchen and learn how to make these things. So of course, I'm going to ask how she's doing it and what are places she should, that we should be going to for food trips. And I don't, I'm excited. I'm just going to stop right there. But the one thing I did want to say before we get started with the show is that again, I want to remind you that we are doing the masterclass on ditching survival mode so you can thrive. That's happening Thursday, January 28th. So you can now go to the Hello Well with Danielle podcast. Um, oh, sorry. You can know the Hello Well with Danielle.com website and you can sign up for that right now. So um, I'm looking forward to that class. It's really about helping us figure out, am I in survival mode? What does it mean to be in survival mode? And you know, what are the signs and how is it really affecting your life that you may not be even realizing? And how can you get out of it? You know, right now is the time, you know, we had the new moon that was so powerful this week. And, you know, I know everyone's doing the resolutions and last week's podcast was all about, you know, forgetting your new year's resolutions and vision boards. But really more importantly, it was about how to forget how you're doing it or how you've been doing it and change it so you're more intentional about it. But like, I just want people to start this year off intentionally and not being like, oh, it's, this is just the way it is. This is just the norm. We have a, we have a way of changing it. We have a way of getting out of it. So I'm excited about the masterclass, but I'm more excited right now about this podcast with Nina. So let's get this party started. Thank you, Nina, for being on the Hello Well with Danielle podcast. How are you this morning? I am amazing. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm. <laughs> we're about to talk about one of my favorite, favorite subjects. I love food. And I think the one thing I love about travel the most is food. That's I know that you agree with me. Really travel, right? Well, I mean, there's other reasons, but like the main one is like food. Yeah, it is. And, you know, I talk about this all the time that I'm so not a souvenir chick. Like I'm not the one to buy any souvenirs for people. So and my family already has figured that out. Like, sorry, there's no gifts going to happen. But what I love doing instead of buying like little gadgets that you're going to throw in a drawer is I love having food experiences that I can bring back home. And so that's why I really wanted to have you on this show and talking about, you know, travel and food and where to go. But there's like, there's so many options out there that's difficult to choose. So how do you go about choosing the right food destination? I allow my spirits to guide me. Um, <laughs> okay, girl. <laughs> right. I literally do, do. I think I've been so many places and I've had great experiences everywhere I've been. It's kind of hard to choose 
But I, I, a lot of times, um, sometimes it's what's trendy, but most of the time I'm one of those off the beaten path type of people. I okay. don't want to do what everybody else is doing and I don't want to go where everybody else is going. I mean, you make a good point with that because, you know, you have the option of off the beaten path or major cities and like, and a lot of major cities, you look at Tokyo and Hong Kong and so many other places, there are some bomb restaurants. Like when I remember going to Japan, wow. I discovered so many different other cuisines that wasn't Japanese food there. And like, I think we were having some of the best Italian food I ever had in I Japan. A soul food restaurant in Japan owned by black people and i think they had better soul food than i've had in the states oh my god but that's true so so how do you pick between off the beaten path and major cities like what's the decision when you're going to a country so a lot of it is the food for me it is the food and it's the experience of like how close will i be able to get in the kitchen how will I have the... Wait, hold up. Are you getting into the kitchen? I can't tell you all my secrets, Danielle. I love Chef. I cannot. <laughs> I cannot tell you all my secrets. But <laughs> that was that, so cool. that, because when you go to the major cities, you know, everything is more mainstream, right? There yeah. is no way humanly possible you're just going to walk up to the chef and you're going to be like, oh, can I see your kitchen? Or can I experience... Like, that's like coming to the States and going to Cheesecake Factory, right? And asking them, they're not going to do that. However, (laughs) (laughs) however, (laughs) if you go to like, you know, certain parts of Singapore and maybe um, the, the restaurant is small, maybe you get there at a certain time where it's at the beginning of service and it's very, very quiet. Mm -hmm. And you have the ability to, and you're pleasant, you must be pleasant, but you have the ability to interact with the servers with, um, normally those types of restaurants don't even have service. The chef is usually, or the cook is usually the one who is serving you is, is very family oriented. And I'm very inquisitive. I'm always like, how do you make these, you know, these noodles or how do you, how does this bread look like? And then some old lady adopts me as her child and I become a part of the place. So Ooh, I need to learn how to be adopted. That's the thing I've been missing. Cause I do talk and I'm very inquisitive, but I'm not at the point where like, so how did you make these noodles? I'm more of utilizing that as a stepping stone to learn more about the culture, the people and their lives. Mm hmm. And then also utilizing that as a way to be like, oh, this has been amazing. What other places do you recommend I should go? You know, I w- I can do that. But I also like what you just said, right? So you can dive into their culture mm-hmm. and you can dive into, you know, like where they're from or whatever. But how about this? Like, let's say that you had a lemongrass soup, right? And you're like, but where does the lemongrass come from? And the next thing you know they, they, some child takes you by the hand, who's about approximately seven to 10 years old, and leads you to this path of like all this fresh lemongrass. Yeah. And you're like, now you could have never paid for that in a major city. You're not yeah. going gonna- It's about the experience. And that's one thing I love about taking culinary trips is that it's more than just enjoying amazing food. It's It's just more than that. It's more about opening the door to different cultures and learning how people live and just really diving deep in. And that's part of the reason why I also like being more off the beaten path because you get those experiences more, even if it's food or not, but adding in the food to it is just a whole other thing. And the other thing I would also mention when you're trying to consider the right destination for a food trip is considering what else there is to do. Like you, you the perfect thing you talked about is being led by a girl allegedly who's seven to ten years old. <laughs> allegedly, <laughs> glass field. Um, but having those other moments, but like you know, say you want to go to some off beaten path. You know, is there a temple? Is there something else? Is there a landmark? Or is there just something else you want to see in that area? So keeping that in mind. Thinking about, you know, mode of transportation and, you know, length of how long it's going to get there. And the most important part is budget. Oh, my gosh. Listen, when I was single, (laughs) 
Ooh, when I was single and I went, I was 25, I will never forget this. I was 25 years old and I was in the military and I was in Paris. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I think we got stuck there, but we had to stay for like two, three days because something was going on with the planes or whatever. And I was like, cool. Okay. We're stuck here. Like what was me? Stuck in Paris. Black girl stuck in Paris. Girl stuck in Paris. And it was so crazy because, okay, so yes, I was in the military, but my, we had, we were male dominated because I was with pilots and stuff like that. So it was mostly, mm-hmm. so, you know, they want to go to the red light district. They want to do, you know, all that type of stuff. The women wanted to go shop. I just wanted to eat, right? Yeah. <laughs> Duh. It's Paris. Less about any of this. And it was, I think we went to a club one night and we had got invited. And for some reason in Paris, there's like no, it's like a time warp. So once you start partying and eating and drinking, it's, you forget what time it is. Mm-hmm. And then it was like 11 o'clock in the morning the next day. But... I remember like we had met these guys and then only one of us spoke French, which was not me. It was like one of the young officers I was with. And next thing you know, we're in this vineyard, like drinking wine. And you know what I like? And and it's like a gift and a curse. So I like the fact that I can go, that we can go to these countries and they have all this history. It saddens me, the curse, and it saddens me that I can't do that culturally. Like I can't go back to some place and like my family owns a vineyard or like owns. You never know. I just read this article about this black girl who you know was raised here and she's a princess from Sierra Leone. Right. You, never, you that ancestry girl. You never know. Maybe, maybe, maybe I cook, and you know we might have. You know I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But it was just so fun, and and like we went from this club, and then we went to this vineyard. And then we were eating, like it was just food and we were just eating and it was just fun. And we fell asleep. We woke up. We did make it back in time to the hotel. We did make it back. But like, that's something that I wouldn't get at, on a tour. No, you would never get that on a tour. And I probably like fell in love along the way with one of them. Because I mean, what guy takes you to parties and then a vineyard on the first day, you know? So a guy after my own heart. <laughs> I don't know why you were. Like, I don't ever want to leave. <laughs> oh, no, I love that. I mean, I love Paris. I mean, it's funny. I, one of my favorite trips to Paris was a layover. I, I had six hours on the ground. I'm like, in six hours, am I shopping? Hell no, I'm eating. Mm-hmm. And like, I have my favorite spots to go to. And I literally just went around town and ate at my different spots that I love eating. I did my own food tour for six hours and made my way back to the airport in time to go to South Africa. And it's beautiful. When you can just experience, and then I think that a lot of people are like, oh, I'm fearful of traveling by myself or the people who they are traveling with aren't the fun bunch and, you know, the fun people. So you can't necessarily, something stops you from experiencing the off the beaten path excursion. However, I feel like, I think I'm so secure in like being, I'm just, I'm just an introvert. But I'm like a happy one, an extraordinary one. But so mm-hmm. food brings the extraordinary part out of me. So I think we need to start relishing in the fact that we are these great humans who can travel the world, continent, country, states, even now during COVID. Like you should, if I was single and with no children, I would be all over the United States right now. I would I be eating my way through 50 states. Like that's what I would be doing. It would be a blog. It would blow up and be major. And I mean, that's what I would do. And it would just be amazing. I feel like we have limited ourselves because, oh, we think that, oh, because we're not traveling overseas or abroad, like we're missing out. But have you ever had Nashville barbecue and compared it to Texas barbecue? I haven't, but I'm a right. I'm, I'm from Texas, so we need a little partial. Right. <laughs> Have you ever had a, a taco? Uh, uh, have you have you have you had street food from New York? Vice street food from California? Like it's yeah. all. Tasty. I'm gonna sit there and say that right now. Ours is better, but you know someone's gonna look at me like I'm crazy because you have papooses on the street in San Francisco. That is bomb. I'm gonna let you have that one, kind of, kind of. I mean, I don't eat the street hot dogs because that looks sketchy. 
and with the yeah, bacon no, we're not eating anyway. But right. the papooses on the street, like no, uh, you just don't understand. And don't even get me talking about Mexican food. So it's just not literally the same anywhere. <laughs> So the question I want to ask is, if you were to pick, let's say, I'm going to give you four. I'm going to give you some options. Oh. Hey, I gave you four. Okay, five. Oh. <laughs> five, five travel destinations where you're like, oh my God, this is the place to go for a food tour. And try to, you know, at least one in Europe, one in Asia, like and, oh, and one anywhere. And then, and then the other thing could be anywhere else. Where would you pick? Oh. I don't like this game. Um, I would pick, I would definitely do Italy. Yeah. Italy has my heart yeah, living to, there. Yeah. Italy has to go down. But why do you say Italy? I know why I do. I mean, everyone who, anyone who knows me knows I am. And Italy is like my second home after living there for so many years. And it also, food played such a huge part of it. But why for you? I like the relationship they have with food. Yes. I like what food does for them and how I just like the relationship. Like it's almost like, have you ever taken a pasta class in Italy? Like the romanticism of how they're making the pasta is crazy. No, because I just had a roommate that would just like, like, oh, are you hungry? Oh, I'm going to whip something up. And I'm like, yes, oh, Mateo, well. I love you. He'd be like, oh, I'm just going to whip some you know, squash flowers with yes. you know, all these other things. And like, he's like this carbonata or whatever. It's like, oh, you want some wine? I'm just going to open this really amazing bottle that was like hella expensive. And yeah, no, food in Italy, it just, when I think of part of the reason why I love Italy so much, because it reminds me of all the memories. It reminds me of, you know, Sunday dinners at my ex-boyfriend's house where his mother swore I didn't eat beef. And that I ate pork and every Sunday she'd make pork and then the father would start fighting and the sister would get in. She's like, she doesn't eat pork. Why are you making pork? I thought she didn't eat beef. And it'd be this whole conversation to the point where I'm like, look, I eat pork. Look. <laughs> I just, that's how I started eating pork again was because of those Sunday dinners. I'm like, dude, how many times can you forget? And are you really forgetting? Question mark. No, because half of the recipes, 90% of the recipes have pork or veal. Yeah. Yeah. I think when it was funny, like living in Italy. I recognized that rabbit and pigeon was common. And I was like, yeah, oh, yeah. no, we're not going to go that way. But we did, we, me, it was, mm, wasn't the first couple, it was probably the, it was, I was in the country for, for four months or so. I was in Southern Italy in Puglia. And I was by myself. And again, my, you know, p- the owners of the hotel I was staying kind of took me under their wings and invited me to hang out with them. And they had this like family meal with their friends. And they started ordering all these things. And I'm like, I don't know anything. I can't understand the things that they're saying. But the one word I understood was cavallo. I was like, oh, shit. We're about to order horse. I'm about to eat horse. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and like the other word, I couldn't, I, like I told myself I'd remember the words. And the other word, I forgot what it is now. Um, I forgot to say it now. But the other one was sea urchin. I'm like, oh, okay. First time having sea urchin. But I love Italy. I love it. I, the one place I had fun too, it was I was in the military. It was um, Doha, Qatar, mm. and that's off the beaten path. I don't think a lot of people think about uh, Qatar as a location, right? Another off the beat. You know, I like Qatar though. Let me tell you. So it was my I think twenty eighth birthday. Okay, I think it was my twenty eighth birthday. We stayed at the Ritz Carlton in Doha. Okay. Which literally sits on uh the, their their Arabian Gulf or whatever. And all the islands look like animals. So it's like a sea turtle or a dolphin, like they're all in these different shapes. Then I cannot drink orange juice. So that morning we had a brunch on the patio where the yachts were. Mm-hmm. We had brunch. And I was like, well, I don't drink any of these juices. Like, is there a way that I can get like a guava juice or like fresh apple juice or something or like pear? I don't just anything that is not orange or lemon or has citrus in it. And Muhammad brought me some apple juice and it was um, I looked at I remember looking at it sideways like, is this apple juice? (laughs) 
And I was nervous. And everybody at the table was looking at me because they had, you know, orange juice. And I was like, but what kind of apple juice is this? It was the brightest green. And it had the foam at the top. Ooh. I remember. Yes. And I remember drinking it. And I knew at that moment I would never drink Mott's apple juice ever again. Yeah, it makes sense. I knew that I had to have. I was like, "Well, wait. Um, how did you? How did you make this? Now, mind you, this is the Ritz Carlton. It's in Doha. The women are not treated the same, of course. Mm-hmm. I don't know how I got into that kitchen, but I got in that kitchen. He showed me this juicer, and I was like, "Oh my god." When I got back to the States, nothing was ever the same. I changed. I was in the military, mind you. Who knew that I would grow up and be this chef? But I remember throwing out all my appliances and I bought me a cold press juicer. I remember going to the farmer's market in Maine and I remember buying like all this fresh fruit, like everything was fresh. And after that, we could never buy apple juice or watermelon juice or any type of juice for that matter. My sons were four and seven years, four and uh, six years old and mm-hmm. were drinking out of wine glasses, cold press juices. Because I heard that, drinking out of wine glasses. Yeah, I was like, we, our lives have been changed forever. We are never going back to Mott's. You do not know who Mott's is, but Muhammad showed me a different way. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. And then again, uh, people would never, never think of that as a destination. So that's two. What's another one? Oh, shopping in the car is ridiculous. <laughs> oh, um, let me see. Okay, wait, that was two, right? Correct. I'm going to say a, a state destination. Maine. Really? Oh, my God. I mean, outside of lobsters, what you got? Specifically Camden, Maine. First of all, Y'all just, that's all y'all, y'all think about lobsters. The fruit in Maine is ridiculous. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, oh, hold up, sister. You said fruit, is the fruit fresh in Maine or are they importing it from somewhere you, else? No, you can literally go and pick it yourself and it's as big as my, like a strawberry can get as big as my hand. The apple picking, the strawberry, the berry season in general. Um, I mean, and then people don't look at Maine because they're like, oh, Maine is cold. Yeah, I liked it because I'm one of those people. I like to use that downtime as a time to like plan and meditate and just get my, you know, mental life together or whatever, which is why Mm -hmm. it doesn't bother me that much. (laughs) But um, (laughs) Maine, it was just one of those places where I was able to nurture my gifts and I was able to experience food different. Like I had never really been fishing I was able to go fishing, but for lobster and crabs and scallops and mussels and oysters and all these things that a typical black girl from D.C. would never even experience. Even crabbing like in like Maryland? I, crabbing, yeah, but like lobster? Yeah, it's a whole different ballgame. But I figured in Maryland, like cause we went crabbing or crawfish whatever catching in texas i'm like "Mm, this is for the birds and then like these fishermen i remember one time i had made friends with um this mom and pop restaurant and they were telling me about this guy like if i really wanted lobster i can go meet this guy at like five o'clock in the morning Mm -hmm. like he'll give them to me for two dollars but they didn't tell me that i had to go on the boat with the man and fish with like they didn't tell me the whole story. They're like surprise, you actually have to work for this. That's why it's so cheap. But it was so satisfying to be like to work for this. And then he wasn't like taking it into a kitchen and broiling it. Like he was grilling them. Oh, nice. And I was just like, what the heck is this new phenomenon? So Maine is like this place. It's very quiet. It's quite clean. But it was it was like just that alone time to kind of like get myself together. And then even for a chef experience to be able to go for like go fishing with a person who actually catches lobster on it. Like this is his income. This is how he makes his money to have these stories like that experience alone was something that I never thought I would ever uh, get. No, I love that. It was great. Um, oh my God, she makes my life so hard with these choices. 
Well, you know, it, I, I and I wanted to give people different variety because I feel like there's so many options. Like I think about so many trips that I made just because of food. Like for me, I went to Thailand. Not, oh, wait, honey. I went to Thailand not because I like Thai food, because I hated Thai food. Say what now? Yeah. Yeah, I went to Thailand. let's unpack this. <laughs> yes, I went to Thailand because I hated Thai food. And I'm like, am I the only Black girl that's slightly bougie? And doesn't like Thai food. I'm like, I think I think I am I'm the only one. I think I'm the outlier. And so there was a, like a cheap flight. I love you know you love yeah. I love my last minute flights. And it was around my birthday. You make me want to move so that I can just like catch those type of flights from over there. Are you kidding me? I mean, you're in. No, you're not in Atlanta. I was thinking you're in Atlanta. Atlanta. Yeah, I was thinking you're in Atlanta. I'm like Atlanta has made great flights. I mean, we don't. If you're in LA, the flight deals are a little bit better, but San Francisco is not as great. Oh, yeah. But yeah, so I decided to go and I was like, okay, I'm going to go to Thailand and see if I can like Thai food. And so I told myself, I'm going to be intentional about this every, at least every other day. Cause I was like, let's be real. I'm not going to kill myself. I'm going to try Thai food. And so, and try something new and different. And so I remember my first night there. I get there and there's like this open market. It looks like this big festival going on, but it's just a typical you know market they have, whatever. And there's all this street food and there's like all these vendors that are all making different things. And it looks interesting, but at the same time, I'm like, oh my God, what am I going to eat? Am I really going to eat off the street cart? Does this really look clean? Am I going to get sick? I'm by myself. What can happen? American. Again, so the part of the reason and I should have backtracked further, I was a picky kid. Like in terms of food, my parents missed a flight from Hawaii back home because they tried to make me eat McDonald's. I don't know why they were oh silly. I didn't eat McDonald's. We all knew I didn't eat McDonald's. And I don't know why they said it this morning in Hawaii before our flight that they were going to try to force me to eat McDonald's breakfast. So I was like, um, no, boo, I ain't eating this. And so we missed the flight. So I've always been that picky kid and to the point where even my first trip to Paris, I didn't like the food. And my parents were literally where I passed out. So my parents were like literally shoving croissants and orange juice down my mouth in the morning because like you're going to eat. You're not going to pass out on this this time. We have things to do. So when I went to Thailand, so it was a while ago, I went to Thailand and... I was still picky, but I was more open because I'd lived in Italy by that point. And I had kind of, Italy really pushed me forward in expanding my palate and expanding into trying new foods. But in Thailand, I was like, okay, here we go. Here we go. And so I ordered like three different vendors and I tried most things. I was like, okay, this isn't bad. One of the things I forgot what it was. I was like, oh my God, this tastes like ass. I don't know what ass tastes like, but I bet this is close. I'm positive oh this is God. <laughs> But the great thing about it. Too, like uh, the American palate is different from overseas. And a lot of restaurants that we have here, like one that bothers me to know in is the hibachi places, is <laughs> very Americanized. It's yes. not what you would typically get, you know, if you go to these places. So when you have it here and then you go to these places, people are are very jaded. Well, see, I was the opposite. Once I finally kind of found some good food, I went to Chiang Mai and found this most amazing vegan or vegetarian, I think it was vegan, Thai restaurant. And it changed my life. I was like, oh my God, I love Thai food. Oh my God, this is amazing. So when I came back home, I'm like, this ain't like Thailand. This don't taste right. Like what like what is this that you're cooking? They Americanize it. Like even I remember uh when I went on a date one time, oh my God, I was I'm like the worst person to date because I judge you based on what you order. <laughs> I'm so, nothing wrong with that. <laughs> it's so horrible. But I remember they said island heat. And I was like, island heat, ain't it always hot? Like I didn't know what what that meant. And then, like, he was telling me, oh, you know, like, one, I said, it's in numbers? What is going on here? Like, it was numbers one through five, and, like, one was mild, and then five was extremely, like, island heat, right? So I remember him ordering a number one, and I was like, you cannot handle spicy food. You cannot handle me. There's no way. You cannot handle spicy food. You cannot handle me. I like, love that. This is a different version of spicy food. This is a, th- I said, this is a Thailand Americanized spicy food. 
which is like my ploy with smoked chili peppers. And you can't have, oh my, I'm like the worst person. I'm the worst. And then he didn't want to have plum wine and he would, didn't want to have Thai tea. And I was like, oh, who are you? Like, I, I don't even know who you are. I don't know who you are. You're not the same person who I talked to on the phone yesterday. No, that's kind of judgy when it comes to dating and food. That's horrible, right? But no, because I cook a certain way also. So if you can't handle this restaurant crap, then how would you be able to handle the things that I cook in the kitchen? Like, what? No, I definitely hear you. Like, right, you know, so- today I got a, my Japanese um, bubble waffle maker out. I'm so excited. All right. So I will take you off the hook just one more location that you would recommend one more location that i would recommend is greece oh i like greece i love greece i like that is very for me it was just very freeing and i got to eat a lot of um i like their their diet because um it's more pescatarian to me Mm -hmm. and i like the idea of small plates anything on a small plate i'm going to eat it i don't care that was like my first time trying real sardines. Mm. I had not. I mean, my grandmother, when I was younger, you know, they used to get the sardines like in the can and they would pop that can. They'd just be, I'm like, what the hell on a cracker with some hot sauce? What is going on there? Mm, that's my mother. And I, she still does that to this day. Yes. To look at an actual sardine and then see it on like this grill with, and they make it and make it like a little um, uh, hummus type of like a hummus with the sardine and it wasn't crackers. It was a nice crusty bread with mm. the olive oil and these spices of oregano and thyme. And and then you have these olive, like it was just, I, I just love it. I just love Greece. And then I was so glad that um, when I actually took a job in DC as a chef, Chef Jose Andreas has a restaurant called Zetania. Okay. And Zetania, um, Chef Jose Andres is not Greece at all. But let me tell you something about Zetania and this Turkish Greek mashup beautifulness that happens in this restaurant. Literally, you feel like you're walking into Greece. Wow. I can imagine his food's good. He has this, um, or I don't know if he still has it, but he used to have the secret restaurant in Vegas. I heard about that. Oh, it's bomb. So it's it's called, it was called E. I don't, again, I haven't been to Vegas in forever, but I used to go all the time for work. And it was inside of another restaurant and it only sat eight people and it was a 23 course meal. Yeah. And it was just the most unique meal I've ever had in my life. And it was bomb. And I would say it was even better than, um, what was that? I love secret restaurants. That's oh yeah. For me, it was even better than, um, was it French Laundry, which was $500 a plate. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Don't do that. Okay. To because that's my husband over there. He don't know it. He don't know it. But So when picking a food tour, what would you, are there any tips that you have for people if they're actually looking for their, instead of just, you know, going rogue the way you went, if they said to do an actual food tour on some of these places, do you have any tips behind that? I would, are you going by yourself or is this with a group? This could be anyone. You know, any of our listeners, they probably travel both ways. Um, my tip would honestly be to, I would do some research first. Mm-hmm. I would because, like you said, like um, you didn't like Thai food, but then you went to Thailand. Like it was, it's different. It's it's different. It is not. It is not an American thing. It is very different. And I will also pay attention to the flow of the culture because the way that we order things here is different than the way that you would order things in certain places. And that's highly important because what we might take as funny or pleasant, they might take as rude. I, I think that's such a great point because I learned that in many places, uh, Japan being one of them, like I went on a, a lunch spot in Japan. I was like, oh, OK. And then even in Italy, like, you know, when you don't want something, you wave your finger. No, and it's not a problem. But here, God forbid you do that. People look like you're the rudest thing in the world. Right. So it's like you want to learn the cultural the cultural food language, right? Mm. You want to learn those. You want to make sure that you're honoring them. But at the same time, if it's something that you don't like or something that you wish more of, that you are gracious enough to ask for it in a way that does not um, disrespect them. Also, I would journal. Yeah, yeah. Because capturing the essence of what you ate in a, in, in, in a journal form 
is a great story to have. Yes, we can keep telling these stories or, you know, you can tell the story. But imagine if you wrote all these stories down and then you have a granddaughter or a grandson who's going overseas and you have these these epic and food adventures that you've taken and they're able to experience that through your eyes. And then you're starting like this. And then also for yourself, think about how amazing it would be. You know, yeah, you could take a picture and post it on Instagram, but what if you could take that picture and impression it into a book and then you've written this great story behind, you know, what happened. I remember I went to a restaurant, I think we were in Keflavik and Mm -hmm. I had just, we were going on, on tour, on our like six month tour, returning to nine months, but we were going on tour and um, I had just broke up with my boyfriend. Oh my God. Before I got on the plane. That damn waffle I had was probably the best waffle I had. It it just, food just speaks to you in a different way. And it's almost seemed like the people in there knew what was happening with me. Mm-hmm. Like I was by myself. I was in a corner, but I was enjoying this great Icelandic breakfast Americanized, you know, because we were, we were Americans and we want our waffles. And, um, but it came with champagne. I didn't know we could have waffles with champagne, I thought you know, yeah, mimosas, but just, it was just champagne. And, and then it was more champagne. And then they gave me like this, um, it was this wine that was made out of, uh, it was very sweet. It was made out of frozen grapes from Iceland. Mm -hmm. I was like, what is this? And then it just, it just remembering that and having those memories. Oh my gosh, it's great. Journal about your food experience. I think that's great. I think journaling is good. I also think, you know, before going somewhere, creating a food list of items you may want or like doing your research. I think doing your research is key, but I think creating a food list of items you may want, you know, also not eating huge meals, Mm. especially like you're going around because if you've had like a huge breakfast or lunch, whatever, when you're out and about trying different foods, by that point, you're like stuffed and you're like, oh, I want to try it, but I'm stuffed. So I always recommend that. And I also recommend having your water, one yeah. to hydrate it, but also to cleanse your palate. Yeah. Keep water on you too, because that, I think I call it a restaurant hopping. We went like restaurant hopping. Yeah. And you don't want to have the taste from the last place in your mouth. No, you don't. You Except don't. If you're like in Italy where everything's like, you know, pasta, saucy, right? Or Paris where everything's buttery and rich. You want to be, able, yes, everything could be buttery and rich in pastas and sauces, but you want to be able to taste because maybe that family is from South Italy and the other restaurant's family is from North Italy. So their red sauce is going to be totally different. Completely oh, different. Go on and on. I love you. Oh. <laughs> and the other thing I'd also recommend is booking like on the first days, if you're going to do like a food tour, because it also helps you get again the lay of the land and of the culture and you get recommendations. I always, you know, again, I can only, you know, emphasize this ask the locals of where you should be going besides where you are. I think that's so important. But one thing you talked about is like, you know, cleansing the palate and, you know, the importance of water. I don't know if you've ever gotten sick from food. Um, and if so, while traveling, like what are your tips or things you always bring with you to make sure like, whoops, that didn't agree with my stomach. Oh my gosh, I've never gotten sick from food. <laughs> I love you. I can't say the same. Unfortunately. What was it? It was my 30th birthday in Ibiza. And oh, I want to go there. That's the place that I've been dying to go. I just want to party for days. Yeah, I did too. Got food poisoning. Oh, no. <laughs> I was sick for weeks because I remember being in Ibiza and having issues with my child partners. I ended up leaving them and went to go stay with my friend Cato, who has pretty much like this mansion in London, which I love him. And I was so sick that I couldn't keep even water down. Like everything just kept flowing through me. By the time I didn't have medical insurance because I was living in Italy. Was I living illegal? I was still legal then, but I didn't have medical insurance at the time. I don't know why. (laughs) I'm like, I don't know. Childhood past. Yes. Yes. (laughs) But like, and also I remember on our, when our last South Africa trip for Rogue Experiences, you know, a lot of the girls got sick and I forgot we were at this one winery and, I didn't eat whatever they ate, but someone else, they, they, there was a you know significant amount of them that got sick and we had to go to, some of them had to go to the emergency room. So I always make sure that I have a, a 
a prescription of Cipro, mm. which is an antibiotic um, on me. I always bring like Imodium. I'll bring that, yeah. active charcoal, which is really good for yeah. many different things. Um, oh. And just the basics. Bitters. Bitters and ginger ale. Ooh, yeah. Bitters and ginger ale will get rid of a headache, migraine, and whatever parasite is flowing in your body to make you sick. <laughs> and um, I learned that from a bartender in oh, Amsterdam. Yeah, that's smart. I do use bitters when I'm like, I, A, I love bitters, but I love like Fernet, which is one of my favorite drinks. Yeah. That's like the, For me, Fernet reminds me of being in Argentina, though. San Francisco has the largest consumption outside of Argentina. Shocking. I don't know why, but that's the case. Mm-hmm. But I drink bitters and like I would go to bars if I wasn't feeling well. And I'm just, can you just give me like heavy bitters and some water and I'll be good. And so I think that's a great recommendation. People don't think about that. It's so easy to access that unless you're really off the beaten path. Yeah, And it's like at every single bar, mm-hmm. every bar has bitters and they have some kind of seltzer. Or a ginger ale, if you don't want, because sometimes some ginger ales have a uh, sugar in it. Yeah. Or you could do a ginger beer with bitters. That also works. Oh, ginger add has- some bourbon to it, even better. Yes, <laughs> and get a little tipsy while you at it. But it's the anti-inflammatory. The ginger is, and then if they are making it fresh, yes, of course. I remember. Where were we at? I can't remember where we were, but it was like a limoncello with ginger in it. And it was so good. Interesting, because I'm like, I am not a fan of, I love grappa, but I can't stand limoncello. Uh, It wasn't like sweet, sweet. The family made it, it had to be in Italy somewhere we were, but the family was making, made, that's what they were known for, the limoncello. But they also made like different Italian sodas too. So yeah. I love that. So, you know, in the beginning, we talked about the fact that I am not a souvenir girl and I like to bring travel experiences home. So one thing that we always do in most of our rogue experiences trips is that we'll have a cooking experience. So like, you know, in Cuba, we went to some, you know, grandmother's house and literally who didn't speak any English. And we like she taught, she taught us how to make these amazing meals. And we've done the same thing in Greece and in other places. And I know that you have this bomb program is to kind of help bring these travel experiences into the house. Can you talk about your um, cooking school that you have starting up in January 6th? I am so excited about Chew Your Health Live Cooking Membership. How crazy was it that this came about because I taught a cooking class for a friend of mine and she was like, you need to teach these all the time. And I was like, yeah, but... mm, uh, mm, she was like, but do it your way. And I don't know what happened, but as soon as she said, do it your way, I instantly thought about traveling the world virtually through food for 12 months. Like I, it just, I was like, I feel like that's what needs to be done. Yeah. It has, it has to, you can't go anywhere. It has to be done. Especially right now when a lot of people are fearful about traveling, but, you know, they want that travel experience. And I think traveling through food is such a great way of doing it. So I know that you're doing, you know, it's a every week there's a session or how is this working out? So every month we are going to a different country. And I just announced this morning that we're going to Greece. I love Greece. Hello. So what's going to happen is uh, before, of course, class starts January the 6th, but before class starts, you're going to know what your spice rack needs to look like for class. So you'll have a list of spices that you should have to create an optimal uh, food experience through Greece. You're going to get four recipes. So you get one recipe. We're going to do a week live. You get that uh, replay of that. You get the shopping guide. Every Sunday, you're getting a shopping guide with the recipe that you don't even have to print the shopping guide out. You can literally go on your Instacart, your ships, or whatever you have, order your groceries, and just have them there. The reason why I did one country a month is because it makes it easier for people to shop. You don't want to go to Japan this week, and next week we go to Italy, and then you have all this excess and I'm really big about less waste in the food department. I think that's great. Yeah, and then all the and then the other great thing is that all the dishes are plant based, so it doesn't matter what cultural uh, place they were going to, what continent, country we're going to. 
We're going to keep it plant based because I think that it's simply easy for you to throw a piece of salmon, chicken, whatever you want on top of it. But I feel like people have gotten a little bored with the vegan plant based and they need more options and they need a little bit more creativity and to be able to create these dishes without stress, right? Because that's what happens. We're going on Pinterest, we're getting these recipes, and then we're like, oh, it looks good. And it says it's easy. And then you see an ingredient that you do not recognize or know, and then kaputs, you order from Uber Eats. So I'm just trying to make it a little bit more fluid and exciting and get people back in the kitchen. No, I love that. And I love that you're doing like each month they get another passport. So it's like, you're getting your passport stamp for food. And I love that it's also plant-based because as someone who is vegan-ish, I feel like I do have a hard time finding things to eat. Like even when I was talking to my cousin yesterday, I was like, yep, yeah, I'm just having another type of salad because I was too lazy to cook something else. I mean, I, you know, I know how to make other things. I just didn't, I didn't want to take the time to make something else. And so that's what I was having as another salad. And so sometimes you just kind of get bored of those things. It drives people crazy because they're like, oh, it's just easy for them to resort to the salad, right? But then you get so bored of the salad or zucchini. Yeah, you do. Or cauliflower. (laughs) Yeah, you you do. You do. You do. So we have. Yeah. So as part of Hello Well with Danielle and Rogue Experiences, we have a special code that we'll put in there. It's bit.ly.com, whatever the bit.ly thing is. And then it is go rogue with food. And we'll make sure to put that in the show notes as well. Um, But it starts January 6th and it's a monthly program, correct? Yes. It's a monthly subscription uh, program. So every month I've already thought about what we're doing in year two though. And it definitely includes you and you're going to be so excited. I love it. So I'm already a member, y'all. And so yeah. I'm super excited. And Greece, again, is one of my favorite places for food. The reason why I love Greece is because like Italy, it takes the most simplest ingredients and makes it into this amazing, magical moment. And so I lo- I can't wait to see what you're going to do because I know you are not my basic B. So I can't wait to see. Never been take- on that list before. Yes, so. you've never been on that list. So I totally love that. So again, we'll make sure that we put the link into the group for the the show notes for this. How else can they find you um, on social? So you can find me literally anywhere. Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Clubhouse as Chef Nina G. Okay, that keeps it simple. Keeps it simple and easy. Luckily, your is easier because mine is not, is, doesn't work out. So I <laughs> like Twitter. I'm like, hello, well, Danny which I hate the name Danny. So it is what it is. <laughs> All right. So at the end of every show, I love to ask like four quick fire questions. And so whatever comes straight to mind, just answer away. Oh, Lord. You ready? Oh, God. Hopefully it's hella well in there. So ooh, go ahead. It is. All right. So the first one, which is interesting that you said that is, so what does living hella well mean to you? Oh, that means having my mental, spiritual, physical, and financial world together in whatever capacity that means for me. Aisle or window? Window. What's always in your travel bag? A wooden spoon to stir things. (laughs) (laughs) I have to admit, (laughs) um, that is the first time I've heard someone say they carry a spoon with them. (laughs) (laughs) What are you, I'm confused, what are you stirring? (laughs) Okay, so... (laughs) Let's say I go someplace like there's this restaurant and they make this sauce and I'm going I always get a room that's like a suite or Airbnb where I have a kitchen because I am going to try to. Uh, Okay, that that makes sense. And I know that I need to have like wooden spoons or something like that because metal will change the color, texture and feel of a sauce because it causes a chemical reaction within pots. So I always it doesn't matter where I go, like there's a set of five to six wooden spoons in my bag. Bomb. I love it. I love it. Mm-hmm. Learn something new. Carry a wooden spoon with you when you travel in case you're making a sauce. <laughs> <laughs> and the last question I have is, you know, it was part of Hell Well with Danielle. We're creating this wellness revolution for women of color to get them to start putting their oxygen masks first and take care of themselves and making self-care. Stop putting themselves on the back burner. Mm-hmm. What advice would you give to your younger self to 
be a part of this movement and to really get into that living of hello well. You need you more than anyone else will ever need you. I love that. Because Thank it's you. true. It is. Thank you so much, Nina, for being here. And I can't wait till January 6th. Um, we're obviously recording this a little bit earlier, but you know, I can't wait for people to join the food challenge that you're doing the to your health. And I am so excited for Greece and the country's coming up more and for everything that you do. Um, you are an amazing celebrity chef and I'm so grateful to have you as a friend and as a chef. And uh, by the way, I should mention that Nina makes some of the most amazing meals that I've had. So I've just, I love, I can't wait. So thank you so much. Thank you. All right. We'll talk to you guys later. Have a good afternoon. Thanks for joining us this week on the Hello Well with Danielle show. Make sure to visit our website, hellowellwithdanielle.com, where you can subscribe to our show on iTunes, Spotify, and Amazon Music, and never miss an episode. Also, you can follow us on social media at Hello Well with Danielle on Facebook and Instagram, and Hello Well Danny on Twitter. And if you like hella, hella, hella love the show and got some good nuggets out of it, know that I'm not too proud to ask for you to please leave a rating or review on iTunes so that we can continue to expand our reach and help other women of color. Again, thanks so much for listening and I hope to see you next week. Ciao.